Hi, Bonte. Hi, Bob. How are you doing? All right. And you? Good. <laughs> you have stoically uh, endured several tech difficulties to get to, to get to where we are, and I appreciate that. <laughs> um, actually, that could be a whole conversation in itself, what stoicism has in common with Buddhism, but, <laughs> but we haven't planned on that one. So we'll put that off for another day. Let me introduce this. I'm Robert Wright. This is The Wright Show, available on both streaming video and via audio podcast. You are Bhikkhu Bodhi, very uh, well-known scholar of Buddhism, as well as being a monk. Um, you have translated uh, reams of uh, Buddhist text into English. And, and in fact, you've translated a, a, a good chunk of the Pali Canon, which is the earliest kind of coherent assemblage of, uh, of Buddhist teachings, right? I mean, um, there is... Uh, there is uh, the, the the part of the canon with the Nikayas, the Sutta Pitaka, is that it? The Sutta Pitaka, yeah. Yeah. Now you've 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 translated a lot of that, right? Yeah, I translated by myself the Sangyutta Nikaya as the connected discourses of the mm -hmm. book. And, and, and that and that is I don't have that book here, but it's like over a thousand pages with annotations, right? Yeah, it's a big yeah. thing, that yeah. in itself. Yeah, and also the Anguttara Nikaya. Yeah, I translated as the numerical discourses of the Buddha. Uh huh. Yeah, that's also more than a thousand pages. Mm hmm. And then, uh, but uh, go ahead. Sorry. And then, <laughs> and then the Sutta Nipata, together with its commentary, the Sutta Nipata itself is about two hundred fifty pages, but then with the commentary, it comes to something like twelve hundred pages. Mm -hmm. And these are very standard translations used by many people uh, mm -hmm. in who who study Buddhism in. Yeah. In English, let me show people a book that, uh, if they don't happen to be scholars of Buddhism, may be more relevant to them. That is also one of yours. It's called "The Buddhist Teachings on Social and Communal yeah. Harmony," an anthology of discourses from the Pali Canon. So, people who uh, would like to make the world a better place and invoke uh, Buddhist teaching to that end might get this. It's a slender volume, and very much worth uh, perusing. Um. So thank you for joining us. Um, I want to talk about a couple of things today. One is kind of varieties of modern Buddhism, because yeah. you've written something very recently about, hmm. about that, about so-called traditional Buddhism, or some people might call it religious Buddhism, as opposed to the kind of, you could say, secular Buddhism that's prevalent in the United States and other parts of the West. And, and you want to argue that there's also a third kind of Buddhism that's prevalent. Yeah. And, yeah. and you also want to argue on behalf of traditional Buddhism, I think. Uh, yeah, I do. Uh, and then I want to talk a little about nirvana, a word yeah. that a lot of people have heard and I think can be used to illustrate a kind of connection or an example of a kind of an interface between traditional yeah. Buddhism and uh, more uh, secular or you might say naturalistic or whatever forms of Buddhism. But why don't we first talk about this paper you wrote recently, which was called Manifesting the Buddha Dharma in a Secular Age. Yeah. Um, and that's where you, uh, you posit this third kind of Buddhism yeah. that you call imminent Buddhism. Now, when you, um, in the course of this, you say that you think one reason that, uh, that Buddhism assumed uh, a kind of a secular shape in much of the West is because of the kinds of motivations yeah. that Westerners had for exploring Buddhism going back to, in particular, the 1960s. Right. Um, so could you, uh, in, in a nutshell, I guess you could say that, that the, they were pragmatic, more pragmatic considerations mm -hmm. uh, in some mm -hmm. sense. Can you both, uh, Talk a little about what you mean and also maybe talk about what led you to explore Buddhism because you were born in uh, New York, uh, mid 20th century, where you wouldn't just in the normal course of events become a Buddhist. You, you must have kind of gone out looking for it. Um, so could you talk about all that for a second? Okay. <laughs> or a minute, a minute. It's, it's a lot. So, so go ahead. Take okay, you, you gave me quite... A number of options here. Which particular thing do you want me well, to? I'll tell you what. Let's start off biographically. What? Mm -hmm. um, w tell us about how you uh, first encountered uh, Buddhism and how your relationship to it developed. Okay. Well, I first became interested in Buddhism 
when I was perhaps, I think it was in my junior year in college, just at that time, this is sort of the afterglow of the beat generation, even before the hippie generation appeared, sort of in that interstice between the two two movements. Um, so through the impact of the beat generation, Zen Buddhism was a kind of fashionable thing to know about. And so there was a kind of wave of interest in Zen Buddhism amongst the particular group of college students that I hung out with. And so when I went to the college bookstore, I found some books on Buddhism and I picked them up and that aroused my interest. And I felt a kind of immediate resonance with Buddhism. Do you remember what it was that you first resonated to? Um, actually, the first books that I picked up on Buddhism were, one was D.T. Suzuki called Zen Buddhism. And maybe the thing that was immediately attractive was the idea that you read in Suzuki's essays about these encounters between the Zen master and the disciple, and the disciple poses a question to the Zen master, and the Zen master does something that seems to have no particular relevance to the question, and yet as a result, the disciple gets enlightened. <laughs> so maybe I was quite attracted to the idea of instantaneous enlightenment without having to do any real serious work. To <laughs> enlightenment via confusion. Yeah. <laughs> um, that is appealing. Yeah. I would be enlightened if confusion were the vehicle. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but another one of the books that I picked up, I think, was um, it was an anthology, maybe it was a signet or mentor series on world religions called The Teachings of the Compassionate Buddha. Mm -hmm. And that had excerpts from the Nikayas and from the Dhammapada. So mm -hmm. that introduced me somewhat to the early Buddhist teachings. Okay, so I had that interest. And then about the same time, I also became interested in the yogic traditions of India, not the Hatha Yoga, not the physical exercises, but the meditative traditions. Mm -hmm. And so I tried another book that sort of influenced my thinking was a famous book by Paramahansa Yogananda, Autobiography of a Yogi. And so you, when reads in that book about the miraculous feats of the, of the Indian, Indian yogis. Mm -hmm. Okay, but then when I went to graduate school two years later, then there came to live in the same study at the same university where I studied Claremont Graduate School and came to reside in the same residence hall where I was living, a Buddhist monk from Vietnam. And so I thought that if I want to learn meditation, that this was the person to turn to for instructions. Mm -hmm. So he became my first Buddhist teacher and my first um, call it the Kalyana Mitra, my spiritual friend. Mm -hmm. And we wound up actually living together for three years. And even though he came from the Mahayana branch of Buddhism, but what was taking place amongst the Vietnamese Buddhists as well as Buddhists in Taiwan was a recognition that to properly understand Buddhism, one has to go back to the early sources. And right. so he placed a lot of emphasis on studying the Pali Canon and learning so, Pali Nikayas. So we should say that, that uh, in terms of traditional uh, Buddhism, there are several main branches. I mean, there's yeah. Theravada. That's yeah. the, the tradition you're now associated with. And that is, that is the, the one that uses the Pali Canon that you right. translate so much of. Mahayana uses a slightly different, though largely overlapping canon, uh, but, but not... Well, but, but one that often showed up in languages other than Pali in, yeah. in its earliest form. Yeah. And then there's Tibetan, which I've seen some people depict as a subset of Mahayana, some people depict as a third thing. But in any event, uh, so th this, it, it, it's a little uh, maybe unexpected that he was relying so much on the Pali Canon in spite of being a Mahayana Buddhist. So anyway, that's... Yeah, in that per particular period, I would say that that was not so much unexpected or not as unexpected as we might think like even though the Mahayana accepts and bases itself largely on sutras which are considered to have arisen later 
and which represent like later phases of Buddhist thought. But as I said, that there was a kind of movement taking place amongst the Far Eastern Buddhists, a recognition that for too long we just dismissed the early Buddhist teachings as being, quote, Hinayana, the little vehicle teachings. But now came an exposure to the historical understanding of the development of Buddhist thought, Mm -hmm. recognition that the teachings of the Nikayas and the Chinese have the Agamas, um, that these texts Mm -hmm. preserve what is likely to have been the most original or the most archaic layer of Buddhist teachings. And so if we're we're going to properly understand even the Mahayana teachings, we have to go back to the teachings of the Nikayas and the Agamas. Mm Mm-hmm. Okay, and do you remember, so so you first learned to meditate under the tutelage of this person, yeah, is that right? Yeah, you yeah. remember uh, early experiences that really got your attention, early meditative experiences that made you think, yeah, this is the path I want to follow? Yeah, definitely. Um, basically, what my first teacher taught me was, but is pretty much within the, the framework of the four foundations of mindfulness. So we started. He started with mindfulness of breathing. We should say this is the classic te- ancient yeah. text about mindfulness, the, sat- the Satipatthana Sutta. Yeah, Satipatthana Sutta. Right. And so we started with mindfulness of breathing, and then from there went into the observation of feelings and states of mind. And- yeah, and at that time I wasn't doing like long-term retreats, because we were both in graduate school, and so there was a lot of work to to be done in, in, as graduate students. But I would put in at least two hours a day of meditation. That's a lot. Did it have practical value? Yeah, I found my mind became very calm and focused and opened up, up a lot. Mm-hmm. And, and mindfulness, could could you loosely describe the practice as just paying close attention to the things you mentioned, like feelings? Yeah, yeah, beginning from with the awareness of the breath. Mm-hmm. And he taught me initially the counting of the breath. But from there, I just moved into the bare observation of the breath. Mm-hmm. And then as one is observing the breath, then the feelings, I'm using the word feelings, not in the usual sense of emotions, but the actual sensations that are taking place in the body, those become more prominent. And so then one directs the attention when necessary to the sensations occurring in the body. Right. And then what I found very, very interesting and useful was the contemplation of mind, the observation of the mind. So dropping even the breath as a meditation object, once the mind becomes sufficiently collected on the breath and just directing the focal point on the stream of mental events themselves and without identifying with them you know taking letting oneself drift along with the succession of thoughts but just observing each thought or each Mm -hmm. reflection as it arises and then just letting letting it go Mm -hmm. and uh so at this point now we you at this point are what you would call a traditional Buddhist, and I guess uh, as you kind of summarize in this paper, what distinguishes a, of course, there are different traditions in Asia, different kinds of traditional Buddhists, but what distinguishes, I guess, pretty much all of them from so-called secular Buddhists are things like uh, believing in rebirth. Yeah. uh, And accordingly, believing that there are different realms beyond the ones that are visible to us. There are Mm. realms of hell, there are realms of yeah, uh, more celestial realms. You'd yeah. rather be reborn into the celestial realms than the realms of hell, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and 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 what uh, determines that is maybe I'm putting it not quite the right way, but is basically karma, which is a kind of cumulative, uh, a kind of a moral. Um, I don't want to say quantification or something, but 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 uh, well, people have heard of karma. Um, but anyway, a traditional Buddhist believes that, that karma is a real force and it's a yeah. moral yeah. force whose consequences yeah. go not just a metaphor for the consequences of your good and bad behaviors in this world exactly but, yeah. but, but a, a force that goes beyond that yeah i, I describe karma 
or I explain it as first karma is identified with volition and then more broadly with volitional action. But what is significant about karma from the Buddhist standpoint is that karma has a capacity to produce results, results which are called the ripening of karma. And those results correspond to the ethical quality of the original action. Mm -hmm. So putting it in somewhat simplistic terms, wholesome action or good conduct generates desirable results good a good rebirth and good conditions within Mm -hmm. one's existence and bad karma or unwholesome actions create an unfortunate rebirth and then produce undesirable results in the course of existence Mm -hmm. and i think by the way that you at one point said karma maybe echoing me and then you said comma we should explain to people there are a lot of cases where you'll hear sometimes you'll hear it a word one way karma Mm -hmm. comma dharma Mm -hmm. dhamma Nirvana, yeah. Nibbana. In yeah. general, the Pali is the one that has the non-compound consonant, right? In those cases, at least. Yeah. And it's the Sanskrit version that would be, I guess, more likely to be used in Mahayana that, that has the compound consonant like karma, dharma. Yeah. It's just that in Pali, what takes place is the assimilation of the R. In Sanskrit, when you have an R preceding a consonant, in Pali, the R will generally be assimilated to the following consonant. Okay. So that's so, why we get kama instead of karma, um, dhamma instead of dharma. Uh-huh. And then in the case of nirvana, in Pali, we never find a, double, a V, the two Vs in succession. So the two Vs, or the combination of R and V, gets turned into a double B, nibbana. Nibbana. No. Okay, so... Um... Uh, Sutta Sutra is another example. The the um, so uh, w- at what point did you become a traditional Buddhist? At what point did I mean? I, I gather you were originally kind of arrested by the practical benefits of meditation, and I yeah. I gather that at this point you were not yet believe. Maybe I'm wrong, but we're not yet believing in rebirth and karma. Is that is that right? No, I would say that of course before I met the Vietnamese monk who became my first teacher. I'm really not sure, actually. Of course, before I encountered Buddhism, I didn't have any belief in karma and rebirth. Right. I'm not sure now during the period when I was reading on my own leading up to that encounter. I'm not sure what my thinking was, but certainly after I encountered that monk, and then not only did I learn meditation from him, but from time to time he would explain Buddhist teachings to me. Mm -hmm. And then he he was sent me also to read the suttas. You know, we we had ordered from the Pali Text Society these um, the existing English translations from the earlier generation. And so once I saw the, quite clearly that the Buddha taught rebirth and karma as the mechan as the mechanism that it, that governs the process of rebirth. Mm-hmm. Then for me, all doubts were evaporated that these were the authentic teachings of the Buddha. And since I place trust now at this point in the teachings of the Buddha, then I accepted those principles for myself. Okay. So, so I, I gather you can't really reconstruct the process confidently, and that's the way I feel about a lot of things in my early life. But it, but it sounds like maybe, well, I guess you just don't know, that, that, that some of the practical benefits of... Uh, uh, kind of established the Buddha's credibility. Yeah. Um, and, and then other Buddhist teachings, therefore, acquired more credibility. Yeah, certainly it was after, like, I experienced the, the, the concrete, pragmatic benefits of the meditation practice mm-hmm. that, that aroused my trust and confidence in the Buddha as the teacher and in the teachings of the Buddhist texts. And then you did you go over to Asia and then spend a lot of time in a traditional Buddhist milieu? Yeah. I actually became first a novice monk under the Vietnamese monk. In America. In, in graduate school, yeah. I became a novice monk within the Vietnamese system. But even my that Vietnamese teacher encouraged me to go to Sri Lanka and become a Theravada monk. Mm-hmm. 
And so then when I finished the graduate studies, then I went to, to Sri Lanka. Mm-hmm. And then I was reordained into the, the Theravada order. So it was in Sri Lanka that you rose to the level. The two levels are what I, I mean. I know if you're, if you're, um, there's a novice monk, and then there's the monk whose name is preceded by venerable, which is what you are now. Um, I don't know what that level is called aside from venerable, but no, every every, every monk will use the title, well, the honorific venerable. Oh, really? Yeah, but there's the first stage of ordination is called the going forth. After that, one is a novice monk. Mm-hmm. And then one will undergo a period of training, varies in length of time, could be from six months to a few years. And then after that, then one takes the full ordination. And then when one takes the full ordination called Upasampada, then one becomes a bhikkhu. And so the bhikkhu is the okay. fully ordained monk. So although bhikkhu is often translated as monk, it doesn't just mean any old monk. Well, techni- technically, the bhikkhu is one who has the, f- the full ordination. Right. And before that, one is called samanera, which means like novice monk. Okay. So did you get full ordination in Sri Lanka? Yeah, I did, yeah. And, and in the course of that, I guess you did a whole lot more meditating. Did you have... Uh, experiences that would qualify as kind of beyond being of merely pragmatic value and in some sense transcendent? <laughs> I don't want to say that I had any kind of transcendent realizations. <laughs> I'm disappointed. <laughs> um, uh, the reason I ask is, uh, you know, one thing you say in this paper is that um, uh, the, you think that one reason that um, secular kind of Buddhism is so common in the West is that um, people, the, the people in the West were, were focused on immediate existential and psychological issues, and here I'm quoting, rather than on the pursuit of transcendent liberation. Yeah. Uh, and now that I read this, I realize what you mean by not wanting to claim transcendence, because transcendent liberation is true enlightenment, nirvana, yeah, yeah, release yeah. from the cycle of rebirth, and you do yeah. not purport to have uh, attained that. No, no. <laughs> okay. I hope I'm not disappointing your listeners. <laughs> I, you know, I, we'll, see how many, we'll see how many uh, <laughs> quit listening at this very point. I'm not sure if we have metrics good enough, but I bet if I find out, I'll let you know how many dropped out when they found out you weren't enlightened. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, but, you know, that's this points to... Uh, a connection, one, one kind of connection between the, the secular and the traditional Buddhism is uh, traditional Buddhists are ultimately the ultimate quest, not that many people would hope to find it in this life cycle yeah, maybe, but yeah. the ultimate quest is from liberation from the cycle of rebirth, right, which, yeah. which, which entails the attainment of nirvana. Yeah, um, yeah. and I, I want to say that like when I first became interested in Buddhism, and then approached this Vietnamese monk who became my first teacher, and I learned meditation from him. I wasn't seeking transcendent liberation. Mm -hmm. I was seeking some kind of deeper spiritual experience, some way to um, deal with the apparent like meaninglessness of ordinary, you know, day-to-day routine, Mm run-of-the-mill existence. And, you know, from my readings, both in the, say, the essays of D.T. Suzuki and in the teachings of the Compassionate Buddha, as well as in works like the Autobiography of the Yogi and some of the works coming out from like Swami Vivekananda, Mm -hmm. you know, I could see that there were these higher states of realization that were possible. Even short of enlightenment. Even. Yeah, yeah. So I wasn't thinking so much of enlightenment and nirvanic realization, but finding some kind of higher yeah. states of consciousness. Right. So you weren't just trying to reduce anxiety, which is a common motivation and a perfectly yeah. respectable one. Yeah, I understand that, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, but but so, so where would you put yourself on the spectrum? Then, I mean, would you say that your quest was spiritual? I'd say that definitely it was a spiritual quest. And, so, you know, though it hadn't yet received as much as sharp and clear 
definition as being a quest for transcendent liberation in the formal Buddhist doctrinal sense. Mm -hmm. Um, Okay. And, and, And would you say that some people who are practicing secular Buddhism have spiritual motivations and even can get spiritual attainments within the context of a purely secular Buddhism? I say certainly that probably most who are involved with um, secular Buddhism are seeking some kind of deeper spiritual experiences. Mm -hmm. Whether it's possible to arrive at what I would call a transcendent realization, which would technically, that would be the attainment of stages like stream entry, once returning, non-returning, and arhatship, the four stages of enlightenment in early Buddhism. Mm whether it's possible to achieve that. Let's say that there's a whole spectrum maybe within secular Buddhists, uh, within secular Buddhism. But if one is a secular Buddhist explicitly and consciously denying that there is such a thing as rebirth and to be taken literally and the operation of karma, the way it's understood in traditional terms, if one is explicitly and consciously rejecting that, I would be doubtful that it's possible to arrive at transcendent realization as it's set out in the canonical text. Okay. One could be, I would say, a, one could probably be a, describe oneself as a secular Buddhist if one, while still accepting the doctrinal framework of Buddhism, but thinking, I'm not interested in things like Bodhi pujas, that's the veneration of the Bodhi tree, and Buddha images and religious activities. Mm -hmm. But I still accept these principles that are taught in the the suttas as valid. In that sense, one might describe oneself as a secular Buddhist. Mm -hmm. And in that case, I would say that the transcendent realizations are possible. As long as you mention the Bodhi tree, I have to ask, was your name, Bhikkhu Bodhi, given you by the people who ordained you? Was that kind of a sign to you or what? Yeah, it was actually given to me by the Vietnamese monk who ordained me uh-huh. based on giving me a Vietnamese name, mm-hmm. which the Sanskrit equivalent of that was Bodhi. And this actually Bodhi is the same in Pali and Sanskrit. Mm-hmm. And then when I came to Sri Lanka and told my Sri, my Sinhalese, my Sri Lankan teacher, that my name in the Vietnamese system is Bodhi. Should we change it? He said, Bodhi is a good name. You keep it. Because <laughs> it's a pretty flattering name. I mean, for people who don't know, first of all, the Bodhi tree is the tree under which the Buddha is said to have attained enlightenment. Mm-hmm. But the root of the word is, means, well, what we would say, call in enlightenment right but, but although more literally it's awakening but the, but but uh it, it's a it's about as nice a name as you could have in Buddhism, right yeah the, the bodhi tree is called the bodhi tree because it's underneath that tree that the buddha attained his enlightenment mm-hmm. before the buddha's enlightenment the bodhi tree wasn't called the bodhi tree right. it was just called a um i think it's called people tree right. and and uh all over the world uh, in, you can find, I think, Bodhi trees that are said to be descendants of the original Bodhi tree. Isn't that, isn't that right? In Buddhist, I, I, I think I saw one actually in the, uh, maybe I'm wrong. I was thinking I saw one in the forest refuge at IMS that was, uh, uh, but isn't that a common thing to say that, uh, to have a tree that is said to be descended from the original Bodhi tree? Yeah. In fact, in, in Sri Lanka, there are many, Many temples have Bodhi trees, which are descended from, actually, the, the tree is grown from a shoot that's taken off the Bodhi tree that was brought to Sri Lanka in the third century BC mm-hmm. by the Bhikkhuni, the Buddhist nun, Sangamita. So she brought a Bodhi sapling, which was taken from, I think, from the Bodhi tree under which the Buddha attained enlightenment. Mm-hmm. He brought that to Sri Lanka, and there it grew over the centuries in Sri Lanka. It's still alive today, though very weak. Yeah. So shoots of that Bodhi tree have been 
taken to many monasteries and then used to grow other Bodhi trees. Mm -hmm. So um, let's talk a little about this uh, third kind of Buddhism that you're saying is afoot today. There is the traditional Buddhism with its various manifestations, mainly seen in Asia. There is the so-called secular Buddhism, and I think that term gained currency particularly due to the writing of Stephen Batchelor, yeah. who wrote a book called Buddhism Without Beliefs. He, I, yeah. There's a conversation that I had with him who's, that's on Meaning of Life TV, if people are curious. Um, and there's an earlier one with you, by the way, if they want to search your name. But um, what is it about you, what you call imminent Buddhism, this third kind of Buddhism uh, that is different mm. from secular Buddhism because it because it definitely lacks the like secular Buddhism this imminent Buddhism lacks belief in rebirth belief in the realms and belief mm. in karma as a yeah. moral force that yeah you know and so on what did how has it distinguished from secular Buddhism? okay yeah okay first I would have to say that this category of imminent Buddhism it that is a designation that I've devised like the secular Buddhists have consciously given them themselves the label secular Buddhists, and they acknowledge, they recognize themselves as such, putting themselves in opposition to traditional Buddhism or religious Buddhism. But I notice that there's large numbers of Buddhist Buddhist centers, Buddhist teachers, modes of practice, which in contrast to the secular Buddhists, it seems that the secular Buddhists actually seriously and very diligently study the texts of early Buddhism and then find ways of adopting for themselves, adapting and adopting for themselves the teachings of early Buddhism without making a commitment to that framework of karma, rebirth, transcendent liberation, nirvana. The imminent Buddhists seem to approach the Dharma, the practice of Dharma, primarily as a means of, let us say, finding a deeper, establishing a deeper connection with their own inner depths, a way of transforming their relationships with other people, and transforming their relationships with the world um, without bringing in any kind of underlying agenda Mm -hmm. or conceptual framework, either of adopting the conceptual framework of traditional Buddhism or classical Buddhism, Mm -hmm. or without taking adopting a stance of opposition to that framework the way the secular Buddhists do. So their attitude would be largely a pragmatic attitude that the practice of Dharma, particularly the practice of meditation, brings the, let us say, the arising of wholesome qualities of mind. It leads to a wholesome way of life, a beautiful way of life. It's Mm -hmm. inwardly fulfilling meaningful, um, transformative in many ways, but it doesn't, let's say, it doesn't look at the conditioned existence within the world as being part of the sangsara, a process of rebirth, which is inherently deficient, unsatisfactory, bound up with suffering, and it doesn't aim at transcending that into a state of unconditioned liberation. Mm-hmm. And, and and neither secular Buddhists nor imminent Buddhists aim yeah. for that, right? Right. But 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 imminent Buddhists are is it a little like the distinction between agnostics and atheists in, in other words where the secular Buddhists are kind of consciously and actively rejecting what we've called the traditional, some people yeah. would call the religious or even supernatural yeah. elements of, of Buddhism, depending on what terminology they choose. Yeah. Um, whereas agnostics are just not passing judgment. Uh, one, they're not saying, they're just not, it's just not an issue. They're, they're, they're not getting into the question of whether these things are true. I say maybe that there's a subtle distinction, or at least the subtle distinction is possible, and that there are agnostics who face these questions 
as being challenging questions and mm-hmm. very pertinent questions, but they come to the conclusion that the human capacity for understanding is inadequate for arriving at a satisfactory answer mm-hmm. to those questions. Okay. So they'll, they'll take the questions as being challenges, but hold that because of the limitations of the human understanding, we can never arrive at a satisfactory resolution mm-hmm. to those questions. And, and do but, I understand? But, yeah, but Sorry. the imminent Buddhists, I would say, I, I would say that this duality, these two groups, the atheists and agnostics, if we can give them a Buddhist meaning, you know, those who explicitly and deliberately deny teachings of karma, rebirth, transcendent nirvana, and those who hold that we can never resolve the questions, Mm -hmm. those two fall within the category of secular Buddhists. So secular Buddhists perhaps fall along a spectrum between those two poles of Mm -hmm. the explicit denial that these are genu- that these are valid principles and a perpetual questioning of those principles whereas the eminent buddhists as that constitutes a category just isn't concerned with those questions okay, okay. now i get it yeah um and does it did you, why did you use the term eminent <laughs> It just seemed to be a useful term. Mm -hmm. And I picked it up. I was reading at the time that I was preparing that paper, um, Charles Taylor's book called The Secular Age. Mm -hmm. And he was made a lot of use of the word imminent to describe those whose whole focus, like those thinkers, or, or people whose whole focus is on achieving a human good within the confines of the world without admitting the, the transcendent possibility, which right. for um, Charles Taylor would be a theistic, mm-hmm. a theistic, um, a possibility of a kind of theistic salvation. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, and, and then, um, so am I right in thinking that one thing, another thing that at least tends to distinguish secular from imminent Buddhists is that secular Buddhists are more likely to go back to the original texts and try to argue that those texts are actually compatible with the secular interpretation. Is that going too far? Yeah, no, no. What one finds, one often finds that among secular Buddhists, what they will go back, they'll go back to the canonical texts and then they'll draw out from the canonical text those teachings, principles, practices that they find useful okay. and beneficial. And then when it comes to those principles and teachings which they find incompatible with a secular worldview, then they will use different strategies to deal with them. Mm-hmm. Either one strategy might be to say that the Buddha was a product of his age, and so naturally he accepted these teachings since like that was part rebirth. of yeah. yeah that was the part of the prevalent worldview right. and so the Buddha, just as a man of his time, had to accept them right so that would be one strategy. The other strategy would say, would be to say that the Buddha actually, through his enlightenment, knew that those teachings were not true, but he used them as skillful means in order to guide people into an ethical way of life, <laughs> since most people are motivated, are motivated by fear of pain and suffering and a desire for pleasure. Mm-hmm. And so by teaching them that if they engage in unwholesome conduct, they're going to meet with a miserable rebirth, whereas if they cultivate wholesome conduct, they'll enjoy a blissful rebirth in that way, the Buddha was able to lead them away from the unwholesome towards the wholesome. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, when I had my conversation with Stephen Batchelor, I think we were talking about his book, After Buddhism, and I said, so is your basic 
message here that the Buddha would have agreed with you about everything? And he said, no, I wouldn't go that far. But, uh, but there is something of an attempt to, to uh, well, he does some of the kinds of things you're talking about. I think he, he, do, he does say that, um, that that rebirth was just kind of in the air. Naturally, the Buddha absorbs it. Yeah. And doesn't doesn't argue against it, but it wasn't the core of his message. That's yeah, it. I know that's Stephen Batchelor's yeah. position. Yeah. So let's do uh, it, it, first before we turn to Nirvana. Is there anything else you want to say about transcendent? I mean, let's say a little more. There is also, you know, as speaking of Bachelor, I mean, you quote you. You say Bachelor uh, is apprehensive that if we do not cast off the belief structure of traditional Buddhism, quote, the Dharma might find itself condemned to an increasingly marginal existence in mainstream culture, catering only to those who are willing to embrace the worldview of ancient India. And that just reminds me of another distinction, mm. again, getting back to maybe a more uh, kind of Judeo-Christian or Abrahamic uh, realm, between kind of theists and anti uh, or atheists and anti-theists. I mean, there are atheists who, 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 don't, who don't really care whether other people believe. Yeah. Uh, and then there are kind of anti-theists who really yeah. want to discourage traditional yeah. religion. Yeah. And, and I'm not, the, the, the parallel isn't at all precise here, but you are saying that um, there are some secular Buddhists who really think it's in some sense or another hmm. dangerous or suboptimal to be teaching the identifying Buddhism in the West with the traditional Buddhism, right? I guess so. I guess yeah. so. Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay um, what, what I would say, though, to, to counter this, I mean, first, I, I don't take a narrow dogmatic stance in saying to be a good Buddhist, you have to accept all the traditional teachings. I mean, I recognize that there will be sort of different lifestyles, different life worlds in which people who are following the Dharma in some way in different life worlds that people inhabit. And as long as they adopt a tolerant attitude towards those who follow a different particular approach, you know, I'm uh, content with that. Mm -hmm. But what I would be apprehensive about, though, is saying that in order to make Buddhism or Dharma relevant to people today, we have to cast aside the traditional doctrines as just being part of ancient Indian metaphysics. If we take that and carry that approach through to its completeness, in the way I say it, we would be casting aside the very framework in which the Buddha himself has, the very framework that the Buddha himself has set, laid out as the setting for his teaching. And these are not, the, when we look at the canonical texts, we see that the Buddha didn't just accept the teachings of karma and rebirth because that was part of the prevalent worldview. He explains his own, the realizations that took place on the night of his enlightenment. The first realization was the recollection of his past lives over many aeons. And then the second was the divine eye with which he could see the passing away and rebirth of beings in accordance with their karma. And then he teaches in the suttas, he teaches the workings of karma and rebirth in a detail, with a detail and with the degree of precision that we don't find in any contemporary teachings. And to my knowledge, with the degree of detail and precision that we don't find in any of the subsequent teachings of Hinduism. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's, why don't we talk a little about rebirth and the associated concept of nirvana, and, and I should say at this point that um, you were very helpful. I wrote, uh, there's a chapter of my book, Why Buddhism is True. We won't get into the title, uh, a question, the question of the title of that book. I don't know if you're among those who, who, uh, who disapprove, but... Um, no, I don't find the problem. Oh, you, oh, you, don't, you don't have a... The problem with the title... Good. You know, I'm glad because, uh, I mean, Buddhists do make philosophical claims. Yeah. Right? And yeah. They, and there are claims like not self and, and emptiness, and they could be true or they could be false. They're philosophical yeah. claims, and that's the point. I'm, and I'm actually going beyond saying that it works pragmatically, although I'm yeah. saying that. I'm saying there's actually evidence from modern science and yeah. in light yeah. of modern philosophical 
yeah. lot um, that that uh, c- corroborates mm. these philosophical ideas. That's my argument. Mm. But anyway, uh, you were so helpful on the chapter. Um, you were helpful in f- various ways, but I actually, you actually read the chapter on Nirvana and Draft, commented on it, uh, and, and, and in various parts of the book, uh, you, you know, when I had a question about a translation, you, you, you had these conversations with me where you would, uh, you know, you would cite the various reasons you would choose a given word to, for a given translation. It was very helpful. You were very generous. Um, and that chapter, uh, whatever, whatever its merits or lack thereof would be worse if you hadn't taken the time to help me with it. But, um, one thing I argued there and it's, uh, it's, there's an adaptation of that chapter in the magazine Aeon, A-E-O-N, that we can link to. But uh, an argument I made is that nir- the concept of nirvana is kind of an interesting interface between the secular or naturalistic or in maybe imminent Buddhism and the traditional mm. Buddhism. Um, mm. And let me try to explain what I meant by that. I meant... I, I guess I meant for one thing is that if you look closely at the mechanics in a certain sense by which Nirvana is said to be realized, by which Nirvana in the traditional sense, including liberation from rebirth, is said to be realized, mm. you wind up uh, talking in part about the mechanics by which mindfulness meditation has uh, some of its beneficial effects. Okay. Okay. Now, uh, I'll, I'll later quote something you wrote that illustrates what I mean. Yeah, yeah. But I want to back into this by um, talking a little about the unconditioned. That's a very mysterious sounding yeah, yeah, word, yeah, yeah. right? And, and it's associated with nirvana because, yeah. uh, 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 and it's so to, to attain nirvana is to, I don't know whether the verb is enter or what, but, but it's, to, it's to establish some kind of relationship with, quote, the unconditioned. Yeah. And I guess the first thing to say maybe is that condition, conditions in, in Buddhism, the term that's translated as condition, and there's a uh, related term called condition arising we should probably talk about, it, but, but condition means somewhat, very much like what in the West they mean by the term cause, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and could you say by extension that the unconditioned, the unconditioned... Yeah, I, I mentioned that the volume of your voice is fluctuating. Sometimes it goes very low. Oh, okay. Then it suddenly jumps up and becomes loud again. Okay, I'll try to uh, stabilize the relationship of my face to this microphone. Um, the uh, Could you... So could you say that the condition, the unconditioned, yeah. is a kind of realm or something in which uh, liberation from the laws of causality has been attained or in which the laws of causality are not manifest as normal or what? Okay, first, the unconditioned is a designation for Nibbana itself. Right. And it the meaning of calling it unconditioned is that Nibbana is the unique entity reality that does not arise through the operation of various other factors that function as causes or conditions. So all of the other phenomena, the things, phenomena of the external inanimate world, as well as the phenomena that constitute the five aggregates of personal existence, All of these are sankata, conditioned, because they're produced through the operation of conditioning factors. Like... um, Causes, we could loosely say. Yeah, yeah. So the body arises through the coming together of sperm and egg, then it's nourished by nutriment. It depends on various supporting conditions, air, water, satisfactory temperature and so on Mm -hmm. and so for feelings perceptions volitions consciousness all of those depend upon causes and conditions Mm -hmm. ibana is said to be a state or dimension or reality that exists of of itself it doesn't depend on causes and conditions okay 
And um, okay, but somebody who has attained nibbana, that would be an arhat, within his or her life, is still subject to causes and conditions, though they have nirvana realization, but their own personal entity is still dependent upon causes and conditions. Okay. So let's talk a little about um, a, 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 a term that's sometimes translated as conditioned arising. Um, and, and I want to say that w w what I recommend here for people who are looking at this more deeply, in general, what I recommend to people, if they like podcasts, is to go find the lectures that you recorded in, I think, the 1980s on Buddhism. Yeah. Uh, they, they were recorded on, you can tell they were recorded on a cassette player. Yeah, they were, yeah. <laughs> because, you, know what, you know how you can tell? It, it, yeah. I'll tell you, in those days, you used to, we used to sometimes, we would reuse cassettes, record over things, and every once in a while, you can hear the, uh, the undertone of the previous recording on the cassette. Uh, that's how I concluded mm -hmm. while listening to your lectures that they were recorded on cassettes. They were recorded on, some of them were recorded on recycled cassettes. I, I, I've, so I, I commend you on your use of re resources, your... Um, uh, your, your recycling of cassettes, but that, that that's how I, I think we would have done the original recording on new cassettes. I'm pretty sure people can judge for themselves. I'm telling you, <laughs> I, I, I make it anyway. It's another reason for them to go back and listen. They're online, they yeah. can be downloaded. Yeah. They're, I guess, they're MP3s or something. It's a really great course mm -hmm. on Buddhism broadly, yeah. And 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 and, and one of the lectures, uh, at least one, is on Nirvana or Nibbana. And in and uh, in that you 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 uh, you talk about conditioned arising. What's the pronunciation? Paticca samuppada. Is that yeah? Paticca samuppada. Yeah, yeah uh, which is translated in different ways for different philosophical uses. But conditioned arising makes sense here. And and this is an actual. It's a little hard to wrap your mind around, but it's a it's a series. Usually ca cast, I think, is twelve kind of stages yeah. of one one set of conditions giving rise to another set of conditions and to some extent it corresponds to a kind of a life cycle right i mean does it entirely correspond or partly correspond or yeah um the traditional commentators divide the 12 links up into three lifetimes three existences mm -hmm. okay but we could one way to look at them that i found is to put Let's see. You could actually break them, I think, into six and six, or is it five and seven, something like that, and put them alongside. And you could see that it's describing the same, basically the same thing from two different perspectives, uh -huh. depending on whether one takes ignorance as the fundamental starting point or craving as the fundamental starting point. They're, and those two are certainly related in Buddhist philosophy, yeah. but... Uh... Okay, so that's interesting. Well, so there's one particular uh, segment in this um, kind of series of 12 where, um, let me see the way it's uh, put. It says, uh, so first, uh, okay, we're starting after a person's uh, sensory faculties have taken shape. You've got eyes, ears, tongue. And it, it is said uh, uh, that according to the doctrine of conditioned arising, uh, through these faculties, a person's consciousness makes contact with the material world, which makes sense. The, you know, yeah. through eyes and ears and so on, a person's consciousness makes contact yeah. with the material world. Um, and then, uh, so, or, or as it's actually said, through the condition of the sensory faculties, contact arises. That's a standard yeah. formulation. In, yeah. in right. Through this, this arises. And then the next link is through the condition of contact, which has just been established, feelings arise yeah and that makes sense uh because uh you know in the buddhist view uh things we perceive with our sense organs do tend to come with feelings attached positive negative neutral and i think modern psychologists increasingly are aware of how thoroughly feeling pervades perception actually i yeah. think that's a case where buddhist psychology anticipated modern yeah. um, psychology but then in the in the next causal link 
the feelings give rise to the, the term is tanha. It's yeah. very fundamental. It is, in some sense, the source of suffering. Uh, it's often translated as craving. Yeah. And, and the way feelings give rise to craving is that we kind of naturally we crave the pleasant feelings and we crave to escape the unpleasant feelings. Right. Yeah. And and so this is where I want to quote what you said in uh, these lectures you recorded in 1981. So you said, it is here in the space between feeling and craving that the battle will be fought, which will determine whether bondage will continue indefinitely into the future or whether it will be replaced by enlightenment and liberation. For if instead of yielding to craving, to the driving thirst for pleasure, if a person contemplates with mindfulness and awareness the nature of feelings and understands these feelings as they are, then that person can prevent craving from crystallizing and solidifying, right? No. Now, it, it seems to me, I mean, first of all, we should say that we're describing, we're getting at some of the mechanics of, of just kind of garden variety mindfulness meditation. I mean, you, mm. you, uh, through observing your feelings, mm -hmm. uh, you, the idea is that you become less of a slave to them because you are less inclined to slavishly thirst for the good feelings and run away from the bad feelings. Yeah. And, and this is uh, said to provide some liberation from suffering, which in my experience it does. And, and it's an in interesting kind of double use of liberation. There's liberation from suffering, which a secular Buddhist could very yeah. much like. Mm. And, but then that in turn is associated with liberation from rebirth to a traditional yeah. Buddhist. Mm. So there's kind of two different senses of um, liberation. And, and I think that's interesting. But, you know, I mean, tell me if I'm going too far here. But what what interests me about this is... I mean, we should first of all say that, you know, the word nirvana is commonly associated in English with bliss. Hmm. And when you think about it, if you're truly feeling bliss, you don't want things to be any way other than the way they are, right? I mean, right, you're happy with the way things are. Yeah. And, and if you got to a point where you weren't thirsting after pleasant feelings and you weren't running from unpleasant feelings. Yeah. That would mean you were happy with the way things are, because whichever feelings arose, you'd be fine with that, right? No. So there is that sense in which nirvana is naturally associated with bliss. But what's interesting to me is to get back to this notion of causality, of, of, of the unconditioned, hmm. being in some sense, uh, removed from causality. And, and here, hmm. maybe this is a specious connection I'm making. I don't know. But, but you know... The, it, it is the ordinary way that causality impinges on us hmm. is through our obedience to feelings, right? Um, the, 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 um, to, the, to those of us who are unenlightened, which is almost everyone, hmm. to some extent or another, we are, we are governed. We are pushed and pulled hmm. through life yeah. by the pursuit of pleasant feeling and the aversion to unpleasant. Right. Yeah. That is the governing mechanism. And, to an evolutionary biologist, it's the mechanism that natural selection kind of, in a sense, latched onto, mm -hmm. getting animals to do what natural selection, quote, wants them to do, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah. so there is a sense in which at least the normal way causality impinges on an organism is, um, is being, to some extent, escaped to the extent that the organism becomes indifferent to the prompting of feelings, right? Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So that I, I guess I'm saying that even if even if the unconditioned sounds like too mysterious and too associated with traditional Buddhism for a, a more naturalistic, whether secular or eminent Buddhist, to take seriously, um it does make sense to think that through through regular mindfulness meditation, you are to some extent escaping not the not the very laws of causality in the most fundamental sense, but 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 the laws of causality as as as, as the brain of an organism normally implements them. I don't know. Does that make sense? I think that makes sense. I would say that 
through the practice of mindfulness and clear comprehension, one is not just reacting spontaneously, automatically through kind of biological conditioning to the feelings that arise. Because, as you say, like normally we're prompted by pleasant feeling to hold on to the pleasant feeling and to seek more of it. And when we encounter, as we inevitably do, unpleasant feelings, then we attempt to flee from it or to push it away or destroy the cause of it. And so in that way, we're caught in this sort of vicious cycle of pursuing pleasure, running away from from pain. And so even without positing a transcendent Nibbana, so just the development of mindfulness and clear comprehension enables one to observe pleasant feeling when it arises and maybe accept it when it arises, but without grasping onto it and seeking um, anxiously to intensify it. Mm -hmm. And when we encounter painful feeling, then we're able to endure it with greater patience and equanimity Mm -hmm. rather than with fear, anxiety, and the kicking in of that escape mechanism. Right. So you could say even that just through the application of mindfulness and clear comprehension, even without positing Nibbana as a transcendence of rebirth, but there's a kind of taste of what's called Dita Dhamma Nibbana, Nirvana here and now in this Mm -hmm. present life just in being able to maintain that mindfulness and equanimity in the present. And I gather you've had meditative experiences where it felt at least close to that. In other words, everything is fine. There's nothing I would want to change about my being. (laughs) I'm a bit of a social and political radical, so there would be many things that I would want to change out. <laughs> but at that moment. <laughs> yeah. But as, with respect to myself, well, also I would like certain things to have been different, like maybe to have, not to have to endure this head pain <laughs> condition. Right, you have, you have uh, recurring headaches that... Yeah, that uh... yeah. I mean, yeah, I don't want to say that I've never wanted that chronic head pain condition to go away. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, uh, so uh, one other, I mean, may, maybe yeah. we can talk just a little bit about yeah. the meaning of, uh, but maybe before you come to that, but sure. what does develop through the development of mindfulness and clear comprehension and this determination is the ability to sit through a lot of painful feeling, mm-hmm. whether it be the pain of the headache, or there's the natural pains that arise in, say, the legs through prolonged sitting. Mm -hmm. And to be able to observe the pain as an impersonal, objective phenomena subject to arising and passing away, and not Mm -hmm. think how unfortunate that I have to undergo this pain. Right. And that comes through a kind of acute awareness of the feeling. Yeah, exactly. which, which, Which is ironic that the more aware of your feelings you are, the less problem they give you. But yeah. but when you think about it, when feelings are really bothering you, you're not that acutely aware of the feelings. You, 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 you're not thinking about where they are in your body, what kind of texture they have or anything. It, it's, um, it, they do their work uh, when they're most effective in, in compelling you, uh, they do their work uh, without you being aware of them. Yeah. And awareness is a kind of, you know, like sunlight is the best disinfectant, as they say. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, I'd like to say something quickly about the idea of suffering. The, the term is dukkha. And I think when people hear that life is suffering, a, a, a purported Buddhist concept, although I don't think the Buddha ever literally said life is suffering, but 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 but, but the Buddha did say that life is a, certainly recurring and maybe even pervasive feature. I, I, I think, is it helpful to, you know, that, seem, that sounds crazy to people, but one, one thing that helps it to make sense to me is when you hear that um, some people would say that if you look at the original meaning of dukkha, there, there was a strong connotation of unsatisfactoriness, yeah, right? Yeah. 
And when you think about it, it is the case that very often in life, you, whether subtly or dramatically, have the feeling that you wish things were a little different. You're not entirely satisfied with things. And, and that's right. exactly what you'd expect evolution to build into an organism, always wanting to do better at getting it yeah. and so on. But is that, is that a sense in which dukkha is pervasive? Yeah, I think it's somewhat misleading to translate dukkha as suffering. I translate it as suffering, because without a translation, if you just retain the Pali word, then you're not able to convey a message to people, to readers of English. But the sense when the Buddha speaks about dukkha in this broad, broad application, the sense is not that life is suffering as such, but that there's always some element of unsatisfactoriness within conditioned existence. Mm -hmm. There's always some degree of a def deficient nature, a flawed nature, and an inadequate nature that are day-to-day -day life is not completely fulfilling. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, so that would be the underlying sense of dukkha. Yeah. The sense of dukkha, this kind of underlying sense that things are not quite perfect, that there's always some degree of, things are always to some degree out of focus or off balance. Right. And even when you're not sitting there thinking, oh, I'm suffering or I'm feeling pain or anything, if you really stop and pay attention, you yeah. may perceive some little thing somewhere in you that is kind of wanting things to be different than yeah. they are. Yeah, yeah. Now that, that leads us to, I hadn't planned to talk about this, but you brought this up, the fact that actually you, you'd always like things to be different than they are. I mean, not just in the sense that you'd like headaches to go away, but in the sense of um, you'd like society to be different than it is because you, you just yeah. describe yourself as something of a, Radical. I mean, one of the questions I get most often when I yeah. talk about Buddhism is, will this make me not care yeah. about, I mean, if it's career-minded people, they say, will this drain me of my ambition? If yeah. it's kind of social activists, they say, will this uh, drain me of the ambition to change society? Yeah. yeah. What's, your, what's your reaction to that? In, in my experience, decidedly not. Because <laughs> what I find is that what diminishes is the wanting things to be different for myself, maybe, for me to get some personal benefits out of things. So one becomes more accepting of, say, the way course, the course of events deals a particular hand to myself. But then what I found over time through the you know, years long or the many years practice of dharma and meditation is that it makes one more compassionate and more open to the sufferings of others and it also gives keener insight and understanding into the, say, the dynamics, the social dynamics that are responsible for the suffering of others. Mm -hmm. So there arises a stronger wish for others to be free from suffering, not only from the dukkha of ordinary existence, but from the more intense types of suffering that are brought about by unjust and um, slanted political, social, and economic systems. Mm -hmm. Has the practice, uh, do you think, made you a more compassionate person? I would say definitely so. And do you think... Do you think mindfulness meditation kind of tends to have that effect? It's not guaranteed to, of course, and we all know of adept meditators who have exploited their students in various ways, but um, the, uh, do you think it tends to kind of in a, in a correlational way, and, and I'm setting aside for now the, the practices designed ex explicitly to cultivate uh, compassion, such as loving mm. kindness meditation. Yeah. Uh, is it your view that just garden variety mindfulness meditation tends to make one more compassionate? I would think so, in that part of the aim of just what you call the garden variety of mindfulness uh -huh. would be, even if one doesn't take the traditional view of eradicating defilements, but I would say that 
the cultivation of mindfulness would have the effect of reducing greed, hatred, and delusion. And that would great, create opportunities for the spirit of generosity, loving kindness, and compassion to arise. Mm-hmm. But from, in my own personal history, even from this very start when I became involved with Buddhism, along with the mindfulness meditation, I was taught and practiced the meditations on loving kindness and compassion. Yeah. Does, lo- does loving kindness meditation work for you? Yeah, it does, yeah. I have trouble with the very first part where you're supposed to like yourself. <laughs> The idea is you start, yeah. as conventionally taught, you kind of start there, right? You think, trying to, to, to uh, I don't know, mm-hmm. to, to deploy loving kindness toward yourself, and then you work out toward harder cases, like enemy, eventually getting to enemies. Yeah. Um, but when you're supposed to develop loving kindness towards yourself, it doesn't mean that you're supposed to love every aspect about your personality. Oh, that's a relief. But it, <laughs> but it means that you're supposed to see that, or let us say, when it's supposed to generate towards oneself a wish for one's well-being and happiness. And I'm then, on board there. Excuse me? I'm on board with that. Yeah. I definitely but, wish myself happiness. Yeah. And so on that basis, one could see, when one practices that, then one could see that that wish for well-being and happiness is, I would say, the fundamental drive of one's own inner being. So then when one brings other people into the practice as one's objects of loving kindness, then one will understand intuitively that at the very base or root of their being is that desire for well-being and happiness. Mm-hmm. And then through a kind of putting yourself in the shoes of others, then one can generate the wish for their well-being and happiness. Yeah. Now, that's one thing that I find uh, plain, just garden variety mindfulness meditation tends to help with is this putting yourself in the shoes of others. Yeah. Bit. Yeah. I mean, at the end of a retreat, whether or not I've done any loving kindness meditation, I, I feel I'm just more naturally understanding of other people's perspectives. Right. Um, which I think is half the battle. Um, well, this has been a great conversation. Is there anything else you want to say about any of this? Um, nothing comes to mind right now. Okay. Uh, there's one thing I want to say, which is in reflecting on this business of the cassettes on which your lectures are recorded, what I may have heard is this. Cassettes, as I recall, were recorded on two sides. You would record one side, then turn the cassette over, record yeah. the other side. It may be that sometimes something from the one side, the mm. already recorded side, comes through while recording the second side. That's possible. That's possible. If I remember, I think I recorded, well, my memory is a little hazy. But I think that these were, could have been 90-minute cassettes in which one side was 45 minutes. Uh-huh. It could have been that in the middle of a lecture that I had to stop the tape, the cassette player, and then turn the, mm-hmm. the cassette around and then record the other side. Mm-hmm. But I, I'm 100% sure that the cassettes that we use would have been new cassettes. We wouldn't have used old cassettes. Yeah, yeah. I, I'll take your word for that. Yeah. Anyway, uh, I hope this entices people to download the lectures and listen to them because I really think you can't do better. As a, you know, if you if you if you want to learn Buddhism while you're driving to work or taking a walk, I I, mm. I, I I've I've seen a lot of these these products. I think um, you really can't do better than these these lectures that you did in 1981, and uh, also they're free, which is nice. Yeah. And one can listen to them. They're on the website of Bodhi Monastery, yeah, okay. where, I, where I used to live. I don't live there anymore, not for about 11 years now. Okay, B-O-D-H-I. Right. Mon- so people Google Bodhi Monastery, they'll probably and, get to the site. They'll probably they'll have to put, because Bodhi Monastery is a common name for monasteries. Yeah, Asia. understandably. They'll put Bodhi Monastery, New Jersey. New Jersey. Yeah. Okay, sounds good. Also, as I mentioned, people might want to take a look at this book, Social and Communal Harmony, an anthology of discourses from the Pali Canon, 
edited and introduced by you. Um, and then there's also, in addition to the kind of these vast, weighty uh, tomes of uh, translations from the Pali that you've done, there's another uh, selected uh, book of discourses that you've edited, w which isn't confined to the theme of social and communal harmony. Yeah. It gets into, you know, fundamental concepts like not self and so on. Yeah. Well, what's the name? Do you remember the name? But, of yeah, that one is called In the Buddha's Words. In the Buddha's Words. Okay, yeah. great. Well, listen, I really appreciate your taking uh, the time, Bonte, mm. uh, which Bonte means venerable, and I gather that's the appropriate way for me to refer yeah. to you. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah, that's right, yeah. Like calling a priest father? Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Th th thanks so much. I hope I hope down the road, uh, uh, if I let some time pass, maybe you'll be willing to do this again. We'll, we'll cover it. Okay, yeah. Okay, it's been my pleasure. Okay, bye-bye.